Louder Than Life is back with Ozzy Osbourne and a rare appearance from Prophets of Rage, Louder Than Life. Saturday, September 30th and Sunday, October 1st. Go to louderthanlifefestival.com for everything. What's up, Loud Mouse? This is Ivan Moody from the one and only Five Finger Death Punch. Just letting you know we are coming to Kentucky for the Louder Than Life, September 30th and October 1st. If you don't have your tickets yet, you better get them before it's sold out. The Louder Than Life Festival. I'll see you there. Louderthanlifefestival.com Hey guys, you're listening to another episode of Redefining the Counterculture right here on Witten Radio. Uh, today we've got a special music guest for you. We're joined by the one and only Dave Cavalier. Dave, how's it going? I'm good. What's going on, everybody? How you doing? Hey, doing great, doing great. We're super excited. Uh, had a chance. You you uh, actually performed this just this past weekend at the Bourbon and Beyond uh, Music Festival, the inaugural Bourbon and Beyond Music Festival yeah, in Louisville, absolutely. Kentucky. And, man, um, but tell us, like, how did you feel being a part of, like, history, making history like that? Well, you know, it's the first time this festival's taken place in Louisville, and uh, we were the very first band to take the stage at the festival. So, yeah, you know, that alone was really just kind of, you know, an honor. And uh, for the people who don't know the lineup, I mean, you know, there are greats on there from Buddy Guy to Eddie Vedder, Steve Miller Band. I mean, just that was just on the first day and the whole of uh, Stevie Nicks the next day. So to really kick it off was a huge honor. And uh, I think for my guys and I, you know, we were just kind of embracing the experience, you know, getting up, getting on there, doing our thing and, uh, you know, just, just really taking it in for all the fun that it was. Absolutely. Were, uh, were you at any point like stressed out or like super nervous being, you know, the, the first, you know, performer, artist uh, to take the stage? Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. It's uh, a couple of people have asked me, you know, like, what's it like being the first band before all these great artists? And, you know, I genuinely feel like, uh, you know, it can kind of go both ways. You know, you can either be really intimidated by it and it can totally psych you out. Or, like I said, you can kind of be, you know, like honored by the fact that you get to be a part of this incredible, incredible group of musicians and, uh, you know, just get up there and be like, holy cow, like, let's do this, you know? And I think uh, that's much more the vibe of how we attack things on a normal basis. So uh, so that was definitely how we kind of we kind of took things on Saturday. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's talk about, like, what goes through your mind, like, when you're, I guess, getting ready to perform. Do you have any, like, yeah. pre uh <laughs> pre-performance rituals or any type of like things you do to kind of help calm your nerves or to pump you up to get you ready? Yeah. Yeah. Breathe. <laughs> That's probably a good one. I think a lot of people who get themselves into trouble, they, they forget that one. It's, it's kind of a big deal. But, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, for bands like myself to travel a lot, you know, um, I think, you know, still being independent where we don't have like, you know, I don't have a gear of 12 guys, like, hauling my stuff everywhere, you know, where I get to just worry about playing guitar. You know, we're still, uh, you know, a young band grinding it out. You know, we're unloading and loading it up. And I think if you get that kind of stuff out of the way as easily as possible beforehand, um, so all you can do is just worry about playing music and doing your, you know, kind of doing your thing there. Um, I know for me, that's what totally calms me down because, you know, once that first downbeat hits, you know, I'm a totally different guy, and I just, the music takes over. So as soon as I can get into that headspace, then I'm usually good to go. But if I'm still trying to uh, find where to park the van, <laughs> and I'm running late and the schedule's a little backed up, you know, and, uh, you know, that that can be that can be a little more stressful than usual. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Is it ever, I guess, inundating or super stressful for you since you wear so many hats? Because... You know, you're an independent artist, and so it's like you're doing a lot of the leg, leg work yourself. You, you know, you're, you are your own publicist. You're your own driver. You, I mean, you do so much. Does it ever get, yeah. Do you ever get overwhelmed? You know, I think, I think it's no more overwhelming than, than most people feel in their normal day-to-day life, you know. I wouldn't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to say, you know, I'm chasing the dream, so – um, you know, it's it's no more stressful than someone else who, who has a normal nine to five, I'm sure. But um, you know, you do have to do a lot. And I think more than anything it's it's, it's emotionally tiring, you know? And uh, you know, and but but at the end of the day it's all worth it. You know, I mean there was definitely a lot of really stressful moments coordinating all the logistics and financials of, you know, being able to be there as an independent artist. But but then at the end of the day, you get to sit there when you get off stage and be like, 
I didn't have some major label just make one phone call and I just got to be here. You know, we got to, right. you know, that one performance where I got to open up for, you know, some of my idols, you know, that I know this is going to be the first of many is, uh, you know, I can hang my hat on that with me and my guys and be like, we built this, you know, we yes. did this, just me and my guys. And that's, that's something to be proud of at the end of the day. Yeah, you know? absolutely. 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 Let's talk about what got you into music because you're super talented. Yeah. I mean, you're Thanks, a lyricist, man. you write your own lyrics, you, you know, you, you, you know, play guitar, you, you sing. Um, it's unfortunate how rare that is nowadays. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> that, that's what's so, yeah, that's what's so amazing to me because it's like, like you said, it's you know you've got so many people that just it's like build a band or build a group or yeah, build an artist. Yeah, for so, sure. You know, to to have somebody that's actually still pumping it out and doing it themselves, it's, it's amazing. Um, I guess what what was your catalyst or your uh, your launching point into music? Did you grow up in a with, with a musical family or was it something? Yeah, like that? yeah. You know, I actually again I I was I was really blessed and lucky because. Uh, so my dad owned a music store when I was a kid, and uh, so I was kind of surrounded by just walls of guitars. So, uh, you know, if you're surrounded by a bunch of hammers, you'll probably be a carpenter. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, was, I was surrounded by a lot of guitars, and uh, here we are talking today. So, um, but, uh, but you know, my dad, he wasn't a professional, but he was a guitar player. And so, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of fun instruments for me to play around with around the house. And, you know, my mom was a great singer, not a professional, but... Um, you know, she would sing when she was cooking and always played these incredible blues records, you know, B.B. King, Etta James, yeah. all these really soulful kind of R&B stuff, Nat King Cole. And, um, and then I always laugh because you take that kind of foundation and then, you know, I have an older brother who I'd steal Nirvana and Soundgarden and Pearl Jam records, you know, oh, from, wow. his, from his room. So, you know, that kind of mix of all of it um, really became kind of who I am as a musician. And then, uh, you know, on top of all that, I just had a really incredible, you know, supportive family and supportive group of friends. And, um, you know, that's kind of what kept me going once uh, the bug bit me, so to speak, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, who would you say, because I know you named off like some incredible musicians, you know, B.B. King uh, is just a legend and it's crazy he's gone. Same with uh, uh, Chris Cornell, you know. With yeah, yeah um, tough. one of my guys. Absolutely, and it's like, um, I mean, their deaths were just, you know, they're still really recent. Um, yeah. But but um, would you say that there's, I guess, one person in particular or one group in particular that you take kind of cues from with your playing style and, and just your style of music? Yeah, well, I, I, know, I know that my love of songwriting in general started, you know, probably subconsciously with the Beatles. I mean, everything feels like it always goes back to the Beatles at some point for most people. But um, I think, you know, as far as my playing and my personal style, um, you know, I've always kind of said that, that the four pillars to my electric church <laughs> were sort of was B.B., Jimmy, Stevie, and Eric, you know, and okay. B.B. King, Jimi Hendrix, Stevie Ray Vaughan, and Eric Hoffman. And, uh, you know, those are by far the records I listened to the most when I was a kid. And um, I think for anyone who's, you know, checked me out live especially, but um, I'm sure you can pick up it, of course, on the records too. Um, You know, you kind of hear these influences, you know, this, I I try to say a lot with one note instead of saying one thing with a thousand notes. And that was, you know, I learned that from B.B. King. And, uh, you know, when you have guys like Jimi Hendrix and Steve Ray Vaughan, you know, there's this incredible energy about, you know, how they play and the environment that they create when they play. And I always fell in love with that. And, um, you know, with Eric Clapton, he's a, he's a blues guy at heart. But, you know, when you listen to a lot of his records, it's not sh- all straight ahead blues. You know, he was a songwriter, too, and a rock guy. And, um, you know, so, yeah, those those are my four guys. Those are my four guys. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, so you named off some, some really, really amazing influences. Um Tell me a little bit about kind of I want to jump ahead. Tell me a little bit about what went into your debut EP. How um, I got a chance to check it out and I thought it was really really amazing. Um, it's been a yeah, it's been a long time since I've I feel like I've really just connected with an album. Uh, I mean I hear a lot of music of course, but just there was something so different about this EP. That. Tell me. You know, what went into it? What was going on with you when you created this EP? Um, 
I guess what what things were you going through in your own life that helped to kind of shape and mold the CP? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, well, you know, I, I had toured for a number of years um, as a member of another band, and it was, you know, like electro pop stuff. I was really more a touring guitar player than a creative force, let's say, behind it. And, you know, it allowed me the opportunity to really kind of see the country and, and get a, you know, move forward as an artist um, in that regard. But it wasn't really my music, we'll say. And, um, you know, and I loved the experience. But then when that kind of dissipated and I got to go out on my own, um, you know, that was really where I got to start asking myself some really cool questions, which was like, who who am I? Who are my main influences? What kind of record do I really want to make? And, um, you know, the difference between that record, Howl, and then the one that I will be releasing in a couple months is that, you know, Howl really kind of, I, I was figuring out who I was kind of as I was making the record, you know? And now I've been playing it for a year or two. And so now I'm really like, you know, I know who that guy is, and now I just want to make him bigger and badder and more of a kick-ass act. <laughs> <You know? laughs> absolutely, but, absolutely. Uh, but I think during the time, um, you know, like I said, I knew I knew I was a blues guy at heart, and I knew there had to be soul. And I I think what really set it all off was I was watching The Rum Diaries of all things on TV one day, and there's this scene in that Johnny Depp movie where they're all dancing in this, like, Cuban, you know, like – underground party red solo cup sweat you know smoke <laughs> and shirts are coming off but everyone's dancing you know and i just remember thinking to myself i was like this is what i want my music to feel like this is what i want my music to look like it's what i want my concerts to look and feel like and i think later on that afternoon i wrote danger on the dance floor which is the very first song off of howl That's and right. that was really kind of what got everything going and then from there, I was like, you know, what's my story? And at the time, I was I was just a bartender in Los Angeles, you know, eating peanut butter and jelly like everybody else, dreaming pretty big. <laughs> wow. And uh, yeah, and it was and it was just one of the things where it was like, you know, you hear about these kind of classic blues themes in Chicago, my hometown, you know, and these mm-hmm. these uh, you know storylines about like my lady left me for another man and I don't have enough money. You know, these kinds of common blues, right? Like, right, you know, we've right. always heard these songs. And then, but in L.A., it's so funny because it's like, my baby left me for the other guy because he drives a Ferrari. Or, oh you know, God. right? Yeah. And it's like, or it's like I, I don't have enough money. I can't do anything because I'm chasing a dream, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's these super common things we've heard in, like, blues. But, like, there's this different spin. And, um... And it was a long answer, but it's like as I was a bartender, I'd hear these people tell me their stories, and I'd relate to them with mine. And I just realized that this L.A. blues thing was becoming real to me. And so, uh, you know, this this version of the blues out there. And, um, yeah, I've always been a rocker, so you kind of put all that together, and that was really what Howl was for me, you know, was just kind of discovering what I thought L.A. blues was or could be and, you know, I was blessed to have an incredible producer by the name of Hal Weiner who has a Grammy nomination, and he just, you know, helped me help mold my music and, and me really into uh, the guy I am today in that record. So I'm really proud Absolutely. of it. Though. I'm glad you Absolutely. Like Thank you so much for listening. Oh, you're welcome. No problem, Dave. Um, yes. Yeah, so you hit on so many different things, and uh, one of the things you said. <laughs> no, no, no. It's perfect. So one of the things you said. Um, it leads into my next question, but. I wanted to ask, you know, what is the biggest takeaway that you want people to get from your music when they listen to it? Um, when they hear that first song, um, the first chord, you know, what is it that you want to convey to the listener? You know, I think I think uh, music for a long time has always been, you know, we're storytellers, you know. Uh, you know, the, the people used to, you know, back way, way back in the day, go tell news from like town to town would be these guys who you know with a little fiddle and would sing a song about what was happening you know all these places far away that no one could be and you know i'm trying to just tell a story and uh i hope that this, the particular story i'm telling either helps you know me learn something about myself through you know that very visceral process of writing music or hopefully so the listener can you know learn something about themselves in the process but you know, those are the kind of the deeper levels of it. But I think, you know, just real surface level, it's like 
a lot of shit going on, man. Like I just yeah. want people to I just want people to dance. You know? Like Absolutely. there's some songs where, you know, even though they have deep meaning or maybe it's just the deep meaning is let's have fun. It's just like I want people to just let go. I want them to dance. I would love someone to call me nine months from now and say my son was your mistake because of your music. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. Like, I, I want to do the soundtrack to some really good times and some good memories for people. And uh, I guess that would probably be the biggest takeaway. That's that's what I hope they get from it. Hey, I love it. I love it, Dave. Yeah, um, man. <laughs> tell me, because um, I know, like, at the festival, um, you had actually um, released a live EP called uh, Mates Sessions. Uh, tell yeah. me a little bit about kind of like what was your um, the, the the deciding factor in you doing that? What prompted it, and um, are you pleased with the outcome? Yeah, yeah, no, again, great question. Um, yeah, the main sessions we released it in honor, kind of of the performance on Saturday because it was kind of such a cool day for us. Um, and and really, it was it was just the fact that I w- I've been working on a new studio record, and I was really hoping to get that done by the festival. And since it wasn't, uh, we added a new song, and so it's going to take a couple more months before it's done. But um, because of that, I, you know, a lot of people, they, they always hear Howl. And, you know, like I said, we kind of wrote it in the studio, and then I toured on it for two years. And, you know, now people see us live, and they're like, holy cow, like it's this whole new beast unto itself. And um, it's so much more raw and visceral. And I wanted that somehow I wanted to give that back to the people who've been supporting me somehow. And um the best way we figured out to do it was to just make a live EP. You know, ah. just get some microphones around a room and literally just have me and my guys like, no BS, we're not gonna overdub this for a whole week and you know, this, that and the other. It's like I just if you were in the room in LA or somewhere on the tour with us, this is what you were gonna hear. And uh, we just wanted to take that sound and put it on tape so, you know, we could give you a little bit of something while the studio record took an extra couple months, you know. Right, and, right. Um, and that was really it, you know. We had these really cool songs that, that we just wanted to get on there. And we threw a bonus track on there that is a studio track that kind of hints at where the music is going to be going to the new record in a couple months. But, you know, if anything, it's it's really a thank you record to people who have been supporting us. It was like... You know, we just wanted a live performance someone could take in their pocket. So if they want to feel what it's like to party with us at a show, I mean, that's this is the raw, you know, energy that you're going to get from a Dave Cavalier show. I love it. That, I yeah, love man. it. Yeah, because, um, yeah, that actually leads into another question I had. But, you know, for somebody that, you know, has never seen you perform, you know, I mean, that hasn't had the opportunity to, um, you know, how yeah, we gotta get you out sometime soon. We'll get you. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You summed it up perfectly. You know, it's like raw energy. Um, just you know, just like you're meeting with old friends, basically. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's like someone even asked me. You know, and I'll, I'm I'm gonna avoid the soapbox. I promise. But like, I had released a song with uh, some of my other collaborators. You know, that had to do with you know the election and everything in November. And, um, you know, they kind of asked a little bit about the back of that song. And, you know, part of the meaning of doing that was admitting that what we do on stage is, you know, we don't sew box up there, at least not at this point in my career. You know, we are the distraction. And I want people, I want our place to be a show, to be a place where people come together. It's a place where strangers dance with strangers. People respect each other. There's love in the room. And there's like, you don't have a job. You don't have money. You don't have any of those worries. This is a place to dance, you know, yes. and yes. have fun. And and that is, in its essence, what I really try to do with every one of our shows. And, you know, being in Louisville, um, you know, and I, 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 I always feel like I mispronounce that because I'm from Chicago, you know. It's like, oh. <laughs> Louisville, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like any, any hometown people are going to kick me in the face for that. But, sorry, guys. <laughs> but, um, you know, having, having the opportunity to be a bourbon and beyond, you know, we just, you get these crowds that all they want is a good show and they want some good music and a good day. And those are my people, man. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, when a crowd rolls in like that, I mean, you can feel it from the first note. I mean, we, we have a good time together and we give them everything they're looking for. I love it. I love it. So I know we, we you've actually hit on this a number of times and I knew that you were from Chicago, living in LA, but we never really talked about it. But, um, 
what's it like for you being a mid midwesterner you know um being out west now is it it's got to be oh so man kind of, kind of yeah it's a up. thing it's a thing <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's, it's a lot warmer in February now than it was in Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> I promise you that. I promise you that. But, um, you know, I I think there is a definite stigma to, and, and I, I'm specifically, you know, not L.A., but Hollywood, you know, that there is a, a lot of plasticity around town and very, really, der- you know, it's derivative of the fact that, like, everyone's out there hustling for something. So everyone's very just kind of self-focused. And um, but you can still meet some incredible people and some really incredible and talented individuals. And um, you know, I it took me a little bit to find those people, the ones who still inspired me, because it's really easy if you're not trying or if you're not paying attention to get lost in the plastic, you know, the plasticity of that town. Yeah, um, absolutely. Because yeah, I'm, I'm a Midwest guy, dude. I'm genuine. I'm from Chicago. You know, I like people. I give you high fives on the street to a stranger if you let me. Like I'm all about it, you know. But uh, you know, they're in, in LA, they're not quite the East Coast, where they're going to give me the middle finger instead of a high five. But you know, on the West Coast, it's just you know, it's it's different. People, um, you know, people don't ask you how your day is and genuinely care all the time. <laughs> but yeah. um, it's just different. Yeah, I don't want to knock on the West because I love it out there. I really do. But um, but it's a little different. I miss I miss the the genuine nature of the you know Chicago people, and I'm just happy to find the creative individuals I have in Cali because you know it's a beautiful place, it's unlike anybody any place else I've ever lived in the world, and um, it's really inspiring. It's really inspiring. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask you now. Um, you you did touch on this a little bit. Um, I, you know, I well, I know that you are you know working on new music. Yeah. Um, what can you tell us about the new album? I know you probably want to keep a lot of it under wraps, but uh, oh man, a, I, I a, wish I, I could just release it tomorrow. I'm so ready for this to be out in the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like it's like the nature of the beast that you know once you once you get you know the music together, you know people people who listen to records you know don't necessarily understand how much time is into, you know, the creating of those things to make them sound as beautiful as they can do when you pop in your headphones, you know? Right. And um, and so, you know, now the songs are written and recorded, but we're still doing all these tweaks and kind of things. So anyway, it's, um, we're, I'm, I'm really excited. It's, it's all, uh, awesome. Do you have, um, like, a, a tentative, uh, like, release date? Um, do you I have don't a- have a tentative release date yet. I'm I'm probably aiming for the spring. Um, okay, I'm going to be right by Christmas. We'll probably give people a breather, get through the New Year, Valentine's Day. Oh, God, right? <laughs> absolutely, and then, absolutely. Uh, and then maybe we'll throw it on a mend. But I promise for anyone who, uh, you know, is getting into the music and hears and loves, hopefully, what they it will have plenty of teasers and plenty of stuff out, and you know, to to get people ready for the release far earlier than the spring. But that's probably tentatively when uh, when we'll get it out into the world. So, I mean, uh, do you have like a title for it, or do you have an idea of like what the title will be? Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be called "Talk Is Cheap," which is uh, is one is actually also the title of um, one of the songs on the EP. Um, I think just that phrase and it's is something that. Uh, you know, is very poignant in a way for where I'm at in my career. You know what I mean? Sure. And, and yeah. a lot of the people I've worked with, you know what I mean? At yes, this yes. Point, you know, and talk is cheap and it's what you, it's what you do, you know, and <clears throat> in this social media world we live in, you know, it's really easy to get a hundred likes, but you know, does that really mean you've made fans, you know, talk, <laughs> no. you know, talk is cheap. <laughs> and so, right. uh, and also kind of too with, uh, some of the other songs that are on the EP, it, it's just I'll share. You know, actions speak louder than words. Whether you know it's about being a better person or being a good lover, you know, whatever. It's just talk is cheap. So, absolutely, I agree completely. Um, I guess in your own opinion or your own, um, yeah, I guess in your own professional opinion, um, what would you say uh, makes for good music, like when you, I mean, because you yourself, I mean, you're a creator, uh, you know, you're, 
uh, a musician yourself, uh, do you have like um, like when you're listening for other when you're listening to just music yourself as I, I guess as a consumer? Yeah, yeah. Do you have what any, what what lights my fire? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, man. No, I. Uh, well, I think I think for me, you know, and obviously I probably romanticize music a little more than your average. My chosen form of inspiration, but um, you know, it's I, I I look for for truth and honesty, you know, and that doesn't necessarily mean some profound song about the meaning of life, you know, it's a really simple song about love, but you know, I think. Even people who aren't music aficionados, you know, they forgive my language, here, but like they can be bullshit. <laughs> you know, and when, when, someone, when someone's singing about an experience that they've never had, like whether or not you can really tell, they, you know, said something they gave up and gave it up, or you just feel like what you can tell. And uh, you know, it's the same thing. And so, you know, when I listen to new music. I would say, you know, that's really what I connect to. And, um, you know, when people aspire to make a song that is only there to make them some money, like, all the more power to you. Not going to knock you on that, do you think? But the stuff that really flips my noodle and gets me going is the stuff where there's a little bit of a greater purpose. You know, there's somewhat of an artistic integrity. And, you know, I think it's also really cool because people come from all walks of life. And so their truth, just like yours or mine or whatever, it's all going to be super different, which means they're all going to sound different, you know, and they should. And, um, you know, every time someone commits to trying to find what their truth is and putting it out in, in music or a drawing or photo or whatever, you know, that's how this world gets so colorful. So I hope that's what everyone keeps doing because that's why I do what I do. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, yeah. It's just that that's a flip the noodle, man. So light my fire. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, yeah. Jay, you, so you were just at uh, Bourbon and Beyond. Um, yeah. You did amazing. Um, tell me, like, what's on the horizon? Do you have any other tour dates lined up? Um, where can I yeah. expect to see? Sure. Well, um, you know, it's it's getting towards the fall, and uh, so that typically kind of be kind of is where a lot of, you know, things start to wind down a little bit as we start to get into, you know, the golden months and everything for a lot of the regions in the country. So um, so we, uh, me, my guys and I are going to be heading back to Los Angeles. I'm actually in Chicago as we're talking right now. <laughs> so uh, I'm in Chicago now, and then I'm going to head back to L.A. tomorrow. And then um, I got to shoot out to do something in Boston before my guys and I head over to Oklahoma City. See, as an independent artist, it's never very fluid. It's always very scattered. You can more or less throw a dartboard at the United States map and just, you know, <laughs> that's how we plan a bit. But um, but after Oklahoma City, I think we'll probably be um, kicking it in L.A. I'm really focused on trying to tie up this record. You know, I feel like um, it's going to be the biggest thing in the Dave Cavalier universe, obviously, and it will dictate a lot of what happens afterwards, too. So, um I just want to make the best freaking record I can and, um, you know, get ready to get it out to the world. And then, uh, you know, when, when all that's good and said and done, then we'll be on the road. We'll be playing those songs as many places as they'll let us. I'll come to your backyard. We'll play it there, too. <laughs> <laughs> very nice, very nice. Yeah, because that, that, uh, I was wondering when, when are you going to plan to come to Nashville and Memphis, Memphis especially, because it's the – you know, it's the birthplace of the blues, and oh he, yeah, and, you know he was a staple here, so it's like yeah, you got to you got to come, you know. <laughs> I, you know, and I love Nashville, and you know, with Memphis, I, I passed through on tour, but I never actually got to really feel like I sat and just got to got to really see it and hear it, and as much as I really would love to. So Memphis, you you ain't kidding, man. And and Nashville, I got uh, I one of my best friends is out there, and. Um, you know, I love that town. I've been out there plenty of times, and um, you know, I, I do want to get out there more because I love writing music for other people too. You know, because there's uh, sometimes you know writing for somebody else kind of frees you up to to do some things or take some chances that maybe you wouldn't on your own record. And um, and so Nashville is a phenomenal place to you know 
meet up with other songwriters and, you know, stretch those muscles a little bit differently. So um, I'm trying to get out to Nashville a little bit more. Yeah. But the band will get out there for sure, too, because Nashville likes to drink and we like to throw a party. So (laughs) those things typically go very well together. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, man. Man, um, but Dave, what do you, I guess, what is the one thing that you enjoy most about, um, just creating music because I know you know just hearing you talk about this this record and then also hearing your music having heard your music and everything I can tell that yeah. this is something that's very much like you're not the type of person that's just doing this for a paycheck like you are the yeah you know? uh, what do you love most about creating music and just having it be such a, a big part of your life I, I genuinely man I, I, I it's about people you know, I remember when I was in sixth grade, you know, the first time that, you know, when you hear those things about, like, you get high, you get high from being on stage, you know what I mean? Well, uh, I, I was in sixth grade, and we were putting on some school show, and I was in the, I was playing guitar and singing with, like, a little sixth grade drummer and bass player next to me, and, you know, the school performance had the kids pulling the parents out of the, the audience into the aisles, and Basically, I had this moment where I looked up and all the lights were going. I was on stage playing with a band and people were all dancing in the aisles. And that was it for me, you know. And I I, I tell people that story because it's like if I was in this for me, I'd have no reason to play guitar anywhere but my bedroom, you know. But I go on stage and I make records to share with people because, you know, I'm not trying to brag and be like, look what I can do. You know, it's like I want to share it with people and I want them to digest it and hopefully give them something that they didn't have before because that's what happens when I listen to records. You know, I, I, I get something more out of it than I did before I push play. And so, you know, having such a profound experience on the back end of that myself, you know, it's just like I'm in it because I would just love to be that for somebody else. So it's about the people, man, always about the people. I love that. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you do. It's fun. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, Dave, I'm all out of questions, but I wanted to um, thank you so much for joining us on today's show. And yeah, hey, man, um, glad. I really appreciate your time too, bud. Yeah, I'm I'm super excited for like what's to come with you because I know I just feel um, and this is why I'm like I'm grateful that you allowed me to do this interview with you because. You know, I know at the festival, like, we missed each other. I wasn't feeling well. And so, yeah, I feel so bad, man. You're all sick. I, 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 I want to, like, bring you soup. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I just, man, I just, I'm just excited that I got a chance to talk with you because, I mean, the stuff you're doing is just, like, it's amazing and it's much needed. I mean, I feel like the music industry, it needs, kind of like, do you remember in the 90s when Nirvana hit the scene, how like everything was like fresh again? Oh, um, yeah. yeah. That's kind of how I feel like when, when I listen to you. I feel like it's it's much needed because we've we've had so many cookie cutter, you know, yeah. created, you know, test tube type you know, music groups and stuff. And so it's just like, it's just time, you know what I mean? And so I, I just feel, yeah. you know, there's, there's this great article on, um, you know, I, I think this is just music nerds like me probably zoned in on this more, but um, this this website called Digital Music News, and uh, but they posted oh, yeah. this really, yeah, they posted this really great article that uh, I actually reposted on my Facebook. Feel free to check it out. But <laughs> but uh, it said really how you know that that Cash Me Outside girl that was on like yes. Bill or whatever, like <laughs> she just got signed to Atlantic Records, I know. like and and they did this you know, article that I think was really, you know, that, that totally wasn't bashing her, you know, and, and I and I respect them for that because it's not her fault. She wants to go make some money, like, go get a girl. But, you know, <laughs> but, like, it, it totally shows you that this music business that so much of us, like, put our heart and love and life into is really kind of split into two different things. And, you know, one of them is the Catch Me Outside people. You know, like mm-hmm. you have a bunch of YouTube followers and blah, 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 and there's money to be made here. So let's go make a quick buck. And usually it's not, you know, the the lar- the, the most depth-filled hacks <laughs> that you will yeah. find. Typically, I won't say all, but typically. And then you have this other end of the music industry, which are 
these DIY hustlers, you know, and this is, you know, I'd like to put myself and it's like, we're just, we're the people who understand before we got into this, that there's really not a lot of money in this game. You know, people are streaming music and not paying a lot for it. And I'm, I don't, I don't hate on the consumer. Like I, I love things when they're cheaper. So get it, get it. <laughs> but, um, you know, us musicians still have to figure out how to exist in this new world where we can still make, you know, an income that can, you know, support a family or support having the idea of a family. And, um, so we're out there hustling, man. And, uh, and there's some incredible musicians that people have never heard of and some incredible art out there. And it's, you know, it's, it's the blessing and the curse that these things stay hidden, but that there are these gems everywhere online or, you know, playing your local bar and, um, you know the people out there. That's where the passion lies, and I I want to I want to say that people are going to get tired of the depthless stuff, and you know the good music will prevail, and you know we're all going to have our time again where real songs and really really beautiful, well thought out albums are going to rise to the surface again. But you know for now we have Kim Kardashian and whatever, so. <laughs> but you know, as, as, so we just we just keep making records, man, and you know, try to make the best one we can, and someone will come up with "Smells Like Teen Spirit," and we'll all be safe. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, Dave, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask, where can our listening audience uh, find out more about you and keep abreast of your 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 you know your tours and stuff, and where can they purchase your music? Yeah, no, I really appreciate that. Um, the easiest way to do it is to just go to the website, DaveCavalier.com. Um, it's got all links to social media. It's got all of our tour dates, past and upcoming, all listed there. It's got a ton of media and, uh, you know, connection also to where you can pick up music on iTunes and you can stream us on Spotify. So the DaveCavalier.com, definitely the easiest one-stop shop. And uh, I always love to tell people, you know, go on Facebook, go on Instagram, follow, and uh, send me a message. You know, tell me what you think. There's, um, you know, no no person out there is is too small to, you know, for me to be like, mm, I don't want to talk to you today. <laughs> like, I want to talk to every single person. So if you dig the music and if you like what you hear, you know, like, say what's up. Let's be real friends, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. Sure. I love it, Dave. I love it. Thank you. Oh man, I'm thanks for having me on. I really appreciate your time, too, brother. People, um, people need people need y'all to spread the love about music just as much as we need the music. So appreciate what absolutely. you're doing. Hey, no problem, no problem at all, guys. If you're listening to this interview on SoundCloud, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. We're also on your iOS device. If you've got an Apple uh, iPhone or Apple product of any kind, you can listen to us by going going to the iTunes Store. Uh, go to the iTunes store, search uh, Stitcher Smart Radio. Uh, that's our show name, Redefining the Counterculture. We'll hear this interview with Dave. Uh, we're also available for Android users. If you've got an Android phone or product of any kind, go to the Google Play store, search Google Play Music, search for our show name, Redefining the Counterculture. Uh, we're also available on Roku. If you've got a Roku television or Roku Smart TV, uh, you can uh, watch this interview uh, right in the company of your own home. We've got over 200 plus hours of original content, programming, and interviews, all free of charge. Just go to the Roku Channel Store, search for our name, download the app. Once you do so, uh, you can begin streaming. Lastly, if you've got a, a newer vehicle, uh, like a Chevy model, uh, you can listen to us in your car. Uh, just go from your, your dashboard, uh, go to the TuneIn app, uh, press TuneIn, search for our show name, and then you can begin streaming right in your own car. And you can come pick me up because I'll probably need a ride somewhere. So you have a car. <laughs> I appreciate that. would be great. Appreciate you. Thanks for watching. All right, man. You have a good one. All right, you too. This is Redefining the Counterculture on Witten Radio. Make sure to check out our website at wittenradio.com. Thank mm-hmm. you.